Hi, you're in Port St. Lucie, Florida, looking at my 220 gallon fish tank. My name is Richard Miller and welcome. Once again, this is a 220 gallon reef tank. Uh, basically, the idea behind this tank was to fill it with a tremendous amount of coral, soft and hard, but also a lot of fish, uh, specifically tangs and a lot of anthias. Uh, years ago, I had seen systems where people were putting so much coral, so much life into basically a small tank where there was no room for anything except what was already in there. And ever since then, I always wanted to recreate that and also have a nitrate or nitrate uh, reduction system where I wouldn't have to worry about feeding the fish and overloading the system. My main focus with, as far as fish goes, was to have as many tangs in the tank as I possibly could without them uh, ganging up on one or two or causing problems. Uh, we have a Polini tang, the Sailfin tang, uh, the Purple tang, etc. We also have a Naso tang that I bought when it was the size of a 50 cent piece. I just wanted to see what would happen. I wanted to watch it grow. Uh, and he's been doing great. I have a particular fondness for Bartlett's Antheus. I happen to think they're just a beautiful fish. Um, so over time I've been able to amass 10 of them and just to see them schooling uh, and to seeing one super male dominating the rest uh, is pretty amazing. Don't have much of a cleanup crew. Uh, the fish tend to eat just anything that goes into that tank. They are always hungry. I feed them once a day. I've had my hippo tang now a year. He is quadrupled in size. The last tang I put in was my purple tang on purpose because I was afraid any tang that didn't have the aggression of a purple would just not survive in the tank with the other tangs. They would gang up on them. One thing that always fascinated me when I would go to a public aquarium is the zoanthids that they would have in their reef tanks. Uh, specifically the large uh, cinnamon polyps, the green uh, paleos, I was always amazed at how big they were. Uh, the heads were bigger than a quarter. And I always wanted to have that in my own tank. And I, whenever I see zoanthids, I tend to buy them. Um, I have a weakness for that. Uh, and also leather corals, soft corals. Uh, gorgonians are a favorite of mine. I love gorgonians. I think there's nothing prettier than a large vase shaped gorgonian just swaying back and forth in the current. Uh, in the center of my tank is, I guess my display piece of, uh, is a large leather coral that I hope one day will just continue to grow and get bigger and keep filling out the tank along with all the rest of the green toadstools and uh, various polyps that I have in my tank. Also in my tank, I do have hard corals not as much as the softs, but I do have some bird's nest, different types of acros, and I purposely would get little frags, small pieces that I would hope would grow into something really wonderful. Um, I take pictures of the tank so I could look at it a year from now and see what a difference it is. I, I try to look at it as a garden that I'm growing, the same way you grow vegetables, I'm, I'm growing a garden under the water. And that's why I love to have the tank packed with life. Fish, corals, soft, hard. And basically, it's like having your cake and eating it too, making it all work together. With this 220 gallon setup, I decided early on that I wanted to do, as far as water changes, small amounts frequently instead of large amounts every once in a while. 
So every week to a week and a half, I'll do a 20 gallon water change, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, and it's not, but they're getting some nutrients, they're getting their uh, things that they need from a fresh bag of salt into the system, it replenishes, and I'm also not shocking the whole system doing a 75 gallon water change or 50 gallon water change. Uh, and the tank seems to rebound from that very, very quickly. Uh, it doesn't really affect anything other than uh, a simple water change and what it does for the parameters. Uh, salinity is at 25. I try to monitor nitrate as much as possible and phosphates. Um, believe it or not, this tank, the nitrate levels are sometimes undetectable. Uh, the highest it's ever been was 0.5, which is, if it was 0.5 right now, I'd still be happy, but it's, as of this morning, I tested it, it was undetectable. Phosphates are below 0.5, and I attribute that mostly to the filtration that I have, which is what you see in the fish tank, all the live rock. Just going through a filter system with filter socks, a large protein skimmer, and bio pellets. And I also incorporated uh, an algae turf type uh, scrubber that grows probably 10 times the amount of algae in this cylinder that I could have grown in the sump, which is what I was doing before. Uh, so I'm exporting the nutrients as best I can, and I think that's the key to the success of the tank. Keeping the tank nutrient poor. I rather add nutrients that are needed than to have an abundance and then have parameters going through the roof, nitrates through the roof, which is what I don't want. I use Salifert test kits, uh, calcium 450, uh, alkalinity can go from 8.1, I've had it as high as 8.4, sometimes at night it drips to 7.8, uh, magnesium levels 1250. Uh, nitrates below 0.5, phosphates below 0.5, sometimes undetectable. And every 90 days I send the water out to Triton Labs just to get a more critical analysis of the water. My lighting grid is basically a composite of a bunch of different lights. I have black box type lights for the LEDs. I also have a Kessel, uh, I believe it's a 350 model for just using as kind of a flood spot in the front to help with some of the illumination. And something odd, uh, I use a power compact 72 inch length uh, bulb setup in the back of the tank to give it some extra illumination. And I also like the softness of the uh, hues of the colors that it gives off. Water movement, I wanted to go with something simple and didn't take up a lot of space. So I went with a gyre pump which I absolutely love. Uh, I actually have it turned down pretty far. It, it's so powerful that it actually push water out of the tank. Uh, as far as returns go, the returns on the tank are not capable of moving a tremendous amount of water as far as flow. I have a JBO pump on the bottom of the sump. It probably is turning the water over three or four times a day. It's not a lot, but it's enough to get the water circulation going. And with the gyre pump, with the wave maker set up, it's more than enough. Well, as you can see here, the protein skimmer is filling up almost the entire space of the front portion of the sump. Uh, it's a Reef Octopus uh, Regal 250 Super Space Saver. I also have just the three filter socks. Change those out once a week. Um, and I also have a little j pump as a feeder pump to my bio pellet reactor, but I have it turned down very low because you don't need a high flow rate. It basically goes into the sump in the middle, which used to be where I was growing uh, the algae as a refugium, but since I went to, as you'll see, uh, an external algae scrubber, uh, it's called a Pax Bellum, it is more of an open space now for just some rubble rock. 
I have a BRS uh, reactor that's for carbon and uh, GFO for phosphates. I don't run any uh, ferric oxide. I just use both chambers for carbon uh, since I've never really had a phosphate issue with the tank. Um, there's really no reason to use ferric oxide. I'd like to thank Richard from Aficionado for coming out to Port St. Lucie to my home to see my 220 gallon tank. I hope everybody enjoys seeing it. It's been a lot of work, but it's been worth it. Thank you.